Welcome to a special session on Awarelog, an initiative for awareness and dialogue. His Royal Highness, the Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, died on the 9th of April 2021 at the age of 99. To reflect upon the life and legacy of the Prince, I have with me today a Doctor of Medicine who has served in many Commonwealth institutions, think tanks, for more than 30 years. He was Deputy Chair and Trustee of the Royal Commonwealth Society in London, he also served on the Advisory Council of the Queen Elizabeth Diamond Jubilee Trust and the Rumfald Institute for Commonwealth Policy Studies. He served in Sri Lanka as High Commissioner in the United Kingdom, where he was elected Diplomat of the Year, the first and only occasion on which a Sri Lankan received this award. He chaired the Board of Governors of the Commonwealth Secretariat and played a pivotal role in facilitating Chogam 2013 and the visit of their Royal Highnesses, the Prince of Wales and the Duchess of Cornwall. He is currently the chair of the Advisory Council for Sri Lanka of the British Asian Trust, a charity of His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales. I have with me today Dr. Chris Nonis. Welcome to a dialogue, Dr. Chris Nonis. Thank you for your time to reflect on the Duke of Edinburgh. Let's go back to the very beginning, to his birth. He was not originally British. What was his childhood, his background? Well, uh... Prince Philip was born in 1921 as Prince Philip of Greece and Denmark by virtue of his patrilineal descent from King George I of Greece and King Christian IX of Denmark. But uh, of course, the family was exiled when Prince Philip was just one and a half years old. And he was related to the Queen even before marriage? Absolutely. He was related both on his maternal and paternal side. Uh, his mother, as you know, was Princess Alice of Battenberg, subsequently on Batten, and she was a great granddaughter of Queen Victoria. So he was, on the one hand, related uh, to the Queen uh, as a third cousin of uh, Queen Victoria, and uh, on the other hand, was related uh, by King Christian of Denmark as a second cousin of Prince Regent. So, uh, therefore, yes, he was related. Uh, both, both on his mother's and father's side. He was also sent to boarding schools in the United Kingdom. You had a similar experience. You were at St. Paul's. Of course, that dates back to 1509. Whereas uh, Gordonston, where he went to, that was 1934. Uh, what impact did this have on his formative years? Well, I think uh, boarding school does have a tremendous impact. I mean, what it does is I think it encourages a certain discipline, self-reliance, self-initiative, uh, it makes one very independent and because one doesn't have one's parents all the time to shield one from all the difficulties and the emotions and the traumas of growing up. Uh, but it does make people independent and make people also, because one has to live with a community of others, it makes one also more empathetic and sympathetic to their difficulties and those which otherwise one may not be aware of. So I think it prepares one. Uh, for life in general. Sure. Uh, going back to 1947, that was when um, he was engaged and married to the then Princess Elizabeth. This would have been a pretty big highlight of that year, of that decade, perhaps of the century for the royal family in terms of the royal wedding that was taking place after the Second World War. How do you look at that relationship, that romance that started in 1947, or well, much before that, but continues? continued until date? Well, I think it's a, it's a wonderful lifelong romance. Uh, and, uh, but of course, if you look at uh, how it began, uh, as you know, uh, Prince Philip spent his early childhood in different oh. countries, France and Germany, and eventually in England, and then settled uh, and was predominantly looked after by his maternal relatives, the and uh, then uh, at Gordonstone, but then he was encouraged by uh, William of Batten to uh, join the Royal Navy, and then at, I think at the age of 18, he joined um, the Royal Naval College in Dartmouth. And uh, during that time, of course, he had a very active service during the World War, and he was in several different places. He was, uh, he also was um, in the Pacific fleet, and he also was in the Indian Ocean at one time. And during that time, I, uh, I must add that whilst he was in the, uh, in the Indian Ocean in, in duty, uh, he uh, was based for a while in Colombo 
on each of his revelings and was involved both in Colombo and Franco-Rhythm uh, during that time. But he, I understand, he had already met uh, the then princess when, during childhood when the Duke of Kent's wedding. But subsequently, when the king, uh, King George VI and the queen, together with Lord Mountbatten, um, visited the Royal Naval College, uh, he was assigned the task of looking after the two princesses. And I understand it was love at first sight. And then, of course, uh, the Princess Elizabeth was only 13 and he was 18. But I understand that they corresponded throughout the war years. And after the war ended, he actually asked uh, uh, His Royal Highness uh, for her hand in marriage. And uh, they were engaged in 1947 and were married later. Uh, they got married later that year. Uh, but of course, he ha he did renounce uh, prior to his marriage. He renounced uh, his royal titles of Greece and Denmark and the royal styles. Um, he also took on his maternal name of that and became a naturalized British subject. But on his wedding day, King George the Sixth uh, uh, appointed uh, him as Duke of Edinburgh and gave him the style of his royal highness. And I think he, he uh, became a prince several years later in the 1950s. Um, so yes, I mean, in terms of the, the wedding, uh, I think that uh, this was something that had obviously uh, happened for a long, long time. And uh, it's an enormous tribute to both the Queen and Prince Philip that uh, it lasted uh, for, for so long, they, she was the uh, he was the longest serving royal consort in British history, serving the longest reigning monarch in British history, and I think that's tremendous. Seven decades of it, and uh, of course they then went to Malta uh, for a couple of years after their marriage, and he was serving out there. And King George VI was then uh, fairly infirm, and and therefore they um, undertook the young couple undertook a common road tour, and it was whilst they were out in Kenya, I think, on treetops, that they heard that uh, sadly King George VI had passed away. And it was then, I think, that it dawned on uh, there was a gradual realization uh, for Prince Philip uh, to Prince Philip that. Uh, he would then uh, have to abandon his beloved naval career and instead uh, look to performing his duty as royal consort, which he did uh, tremendously well for the next seven decades. In fact, at the coronation in 1953, he took an oath of allegiance and uh, for service uh, and duty uh, to the Queen for the rest, uh, for the rest of his, his time. And I think he did so very well. And he also went on to be the longest lived male member of the royal family. Uh, Absolutely. And his years of service, as you mentioned, whether it was from the coronation onwards, we saw uh, him only taking retirement just a few years ago. Uh, until then, he continued service uh, to the country, to the Queen. Uh, but when we look at uh, his legacy, when we talk about what he contributed throughout this period, uh, how would you reflect upon him as uh, an individual who uh, not only supported the Queen, but also had a very unique role to play? This was something very different at that time, from the 50s onwards. No doubt it was a very unique position that he had. Uh, he was always one step behind the Queen. The Queen was uh, the main focus, but Prince Philip also remained uh, very much a part and parcel of the royal family uh, as a very senior royal. How would you reflect on that? Yes, absolutely. I think that he uh, absolutely understood uh, the role of a royal consort, and uh, he never in, at any time overshadowed Her Majesty, but yet he was always there to support her. I mean, doing the, the short while, say, the 30 years in which I've 
had several interactions in several different capacities within the, the several different Commonwealth institutions. I've always been pretty impressed by how wonderfully they partner together at every event, at every uh, everything they do. And I must say, in addition to that, he also carved out a very strong role for himself. You have to remember he was the patron of over 900 organizations. He was a pas passionate uh, environmentalist. He was a great advocate for conservation. I think he was the president of the World Wildlife Fund from the 1960s, 1961. Um, and when he was talking about the uh, imperative of saving the environment, I think many people around him really didn't understand in any way uh, what he was talking about, but he was years ahead of them. Uh, he, I think, was patron of the British Heart Foundation for only 50 years. And uh, he was also very, very interested in technology, very interested. He promoted, did a lot for promoting British business abroad and uh, did a lot to try and upgrade things and, and to promote new technologies. And also, of course, his background was, of course, he was a great sportsman. You know, he was a great polo player in the 1960s, probably one of the best polo players, um, and certainly in the top four or five in, in England. And, uh, and he took up, uh, uh, he was also a great sailor, of course, with his naval background. But he was also tremendously, uh, uh, and uh, of course, probably the, the greatest thing that people remember that he did was, of course, uh, starting the Duke of Edinburgh's award scheme together with Kurt Hahn, who was uh, the founder of Gordonstone. And uh, you look at it today, I mean, over six and a half, seven million youngsters throughout the world have been able to discover their talents, to unleash their hidden talents, to develop a self confidence and leadership skills through the Duke of Edinburgh's award scheme. Uh, and I, and uh, he's also been a patron of so many uh, Commonwealth institutions. And I think he's been a great sport uh, to Her Majesty in all her uh, her duties. And he did this right up until his retirement. Absolutely. Just a few years yeah, ago. Yeah, I mean, I mean how many, at his retirement at the age of 96, <laughs> I don't know how many people around the world uh, would actually carry on till working till 96 and then actually retire at the age of 96. I think it's absolutely phenomenal and something that people have, Taken for granted. You've already had four careers under your belt. Uh, you've been adopting the NHS. You've been heavily involved with the Commonwealth institutions and think tanks. You've also led a 180 year old conglomerate and been Sri Lanka's High Commission to the Court of St. James. When you look at the fact that people do have the capacity to go on, do you think humor played a big role in his life? Was that something that really propelled him forward? And have you experienced it? Well, many people said so. Uh, I mean, every time, I must say, every time I've uh, interacted, well, almost every time I've interacted with him, it's, there's been one joke or another. I mean, he's absolutely, he's got tremendous humor and he's extremely witty. Uh, and, uh, well, let me think of, uh, if one looks at his, from his nail side, uh, I remember I was once, uh, many, many years ago, maybe 20, 25 years ago, he was, uh, uh, we were down the, uh, along the line and he came up to me, uh, as one does, and he said, uh, I was quite young then, I was, I think, uh, an person, junior, junior doctor. He said, are you a naval man? So I was kind of taken aback and I said, uh, no, your highness, I, I'm a doctor of medicine. Uh, why do you ask? And he said, because you, you're wearing a naval tie. <laughs> you know, and then I looked down at my tie and I suddenly realized, uh, of course, I belong to the Naval Club uh, uh, in Mayfair. And uh, obviously, I put on whichever tie matched my suit <laughs> at the time so that I would be well in time for the event. And uh, what's impressive is that he was standing a fair distance uh, away from it. And even with my glasses, I don't think I would have noticed the crest on the Naval tie. Um, but it was quite funny. And it, and it you know, uh, broke the ice and... Uh, I remember another time, I mean, as, as a doctor, uh, I mean, as you know, as I said, he, uh, he chaired, uh, he was the patron of the British Heart Foundation and he was very interested in healthcare and so on. And 
uh, we were having a little chat about my work in the National Health Service um, and uh, uh, about the challenges of the uh, NHS and and and, uh, and how it's such a wonderful institution. I was telling him how wonderful an institution it was. And so we were all in line. And um, rather than moving forward as the retinue does, having spoken about the NHS, he then suddenly turned round and walked in the opposite direction, and which they don't, they don't normally um, uh, sort of retrace. Uh, one doesn't normally retrace one's steps. And he went and spoke to someone a few places down whom he'd already spoken to. A lady, and they brought her up towards me and said, "Well, young doctor, this lady is very senior at the College of Nursing, and now that I've put a nurse and doctor together, who knows what might happen?" <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, we were all a little bit shocked, but it, then laughter because it was just so funny. Because at all, a lot of these events, whether Commonwealth or other official events uh, or institutional events, people are all all a bit daunted. And all a bit uh, worried, uh, and uh, he has this amazing knack of putting people at ease, and extremely, extremely sharp-witted. You know, it's always been like that. And I remember many, many, many years later when I when I uh, took up the post of uh, uh, high commissioner, uh, and we were all, we were at a palace event and chattering away, and he came up to us and said, "You all look rather smart. I mean." Uh, all of you high commissioners, what what do I call a, a group of very smart, chattering high commissioners? Do I call them a gaggle of high commissioners? <laughs> <laughs> but I think uh, I think the funniest one, though, the one I is the most memorable one, uh, is when I uh, some of my colleagues. This this happened several years ago. Some of my colleagues were with their wives, and um, so he came. The duke came along to us, and, and I was with my. Uh, I was accompanied by one of my older sisters. So he came up to me and said, well, um, is this lovely lady your dear wife? And I said, no, Your Highness, uh, it's my elder sister. He said, huh, really? How many sisters do you have? So I said, I've got three, Your Highness, two elder and one much younger. Uh, I've got three. And he said, lucky you. I've got four, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and you know, it was seeing my sister's mm -hmm. face. But, you know, it was very funny because it was very witty and it was not intended in any, in any uh, negative way. It was just extremely witty at the time. And uh, in this way, he manages to actually uh, sort of relax the crowd and relax the people. And wherever he goes, there's lots of laughter behind him. So I, I do remember, I mean, I can relate to a lot of other things, but then the, those are probably the most memorable. Certainly humor did play a big role Absolutely. in um, his life and the yeah. uh, service that he uh, yeah. rendered. And talking of the service, and he was very involved with the Commonwealth, mm -hmm. whether he was with starting the Commonwealth Study Conferences or accompanying Her Majesty the Queen for so many chogams around the world, uh, as well as those in the United Kingdom. Um, we now see Prince Charles playing a very, very prominent role in the Commonwealth. Uh, he was in Colombo for the 2013 uh, sessions as well. Going into the future, what do you see the role of the royal family being within the Commonwealth? Well, firstly, I think that Her Majesty Queen has been the glue, the Commonwealth glue that has held all these diverse cultures and countries together in the Commonwealth as an institution. And I think she has uh, seen it evolve tremendously over the years to what it is today. But I uh, also have had the uh, uh, privilege uh, of interacting with His Royal Highness Prince Charles on numerous occasions and uh, played a, a little part in uh, assisting uh, and facilitating uh, the trouble for Sri Lanka during my time as High Commissioner and, uh, and also facilitating uh, his the visit of His Highness Prince Charles and Duchess Camilla, and also being a little bit involved with uh, some of one of his charities, the British Asian Trust. What I have realized, Prince Charles has a very deep and nuanced understanding of the Commonwealth. He's visited over 40 countries of the 50 or so Commonwealth countries. Um, he's taken part in so many things. He was involved very much in the Commonwealth Development Corporation many years ago. He's um, 
represented Her Majesty at the Chogun in Sri Lanka in 2013. And I think it's he has a very, very uh, empathetic view of the very diverse cultures that make up this rich tapestry of the Commonwealth. And certainly in interacting, uh, for example, even with his views and uh, what he does and the initiatives he does uh, with even the British Asian Trust, you know, he has a really deep uh, interest uh, and understanding of Commonwealth countries. And I think that um, I have no doubt that he followed in an exemplary manner uh, Her Majesty in Her Majesty's footsteps as the future uh, head of the Commonwealth. Um, what would you say was the legacy of Prince Philip? Well, Prince Philip, I think, I think you said so much that he uh, he was the longest serving royal consort in British history, uh, and I think that he was to me the quintessential gentleman because he gave up his beloved naval career. He had a challenging childhood. He gave up his beloved naval career and focused himself and committed himself in every manner to his duty, which was to serve and support his wife, the Queen, and the monarchy, and the country, and the Commonwealth during this second Elizabethan era, and I think that was his legacy. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Dr. Nance, for taking time to reflect on the life and legacy of His Royal Highness, the Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. And with that, we end this session where we focused on a very long, distinguished and amazing contribution that was made by a single individual in a country which had an impact beyond uh, the shores of that country. And that's what we've seen through the life and times of Prince Philip. And with that, we end this session on a dialogue. Thank you for joining us. And as Dr. Nonis just mentioned, what we saw was his contribution to Queen, Country and Commonwealth in this, the second Elizabethan era. Thank you very much.